The great body of science fiction work produced in the 1970s and the decades thereafter is home to a tremendous variety of fictional universes, alien worlds and speculative evolution concepts which can still surprise us in the present day. It's a real shame that not many more people read these books because they really are treasure troves of lost tales and stories. One such concept we will consider today comes from the Danish-American writer Paul Anderson from his story The Queen of Air and Darkness. Now, I came across this story in a vintage collection of Paul Anderson's books called The Book of Paul Anderson, a treasure box of science fiction by the Master of Masters. And where I live, these books are rare to find. They are usually bought and brought over to this part of the world by American and British tourists and are forgotten. Years later, they surface in second-hand bookshops or even antique shops or even more ridiculously as decoration in certain booksy cafes which have vintage books by the kilogram lining their walls as if it's going to make the place look more relatable with lots of sad discarded old books of unknown provenance lining the walls but I guess that's how the contemporary normie mind works anyways I found my copy of the book of Paul Anderson in one such source and acquired it within discreet means and I've been really enjoying it ever since if you're living in a part of the world with more access to such second-hand vintage science fiction books such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia or New Zealand, I really suggest you dig deeper into these gold mines, literally go to any second-hand bookshop you like and randomly pick out a book you might like. You can search by author, names such as Paul Anderson, Robert Silverberg, Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, such names are always a good bet. Or you can even look for books by cover. There are certain books with just fancy fantastic cover illustrations which when you read them turn out to be great. Anyways, that aside being over, let us now dive into the world of the Queen of Air and Darkness and investigate the incredible concept of alien, telepathic, biopunk little people that this story introduces. Before beginning, I would like to remind you that you are on the CM Cosman channel and every contribution you can make on Patreon or the merch store will be most welcome. I also used to have a Buy Me A Coffee account, but until further notice, I cannot process payments from there. So let's stop using that for a while. Anyways, back to the Queen of Air and Darkness. It considers a kind of speculative evolution scenario that is extremely creative. You know, you think you read everything under the sun, you think you read everything evolving into everything else, every sort of human and alien civilizational encounter possible. But no, actually, this story comes out with a really original concept of how alien ecologies might interact with human colonizers on their planet. And it is little wonder because Paul Anderson is actually one of the best authors when it comes to creating realistic yet strange alien cultures, biologies or even entire lines of evolution. And he also brings further life into these creations by really meticulously and intoxicatingly mapping out and telling their interactions with human beings. So our story in The Queen of Air and Darkness is set in a colony world called Roland. Now this is a staple sort of 1970s 
science fiction universe where humanity has colonized a number of different planets across the galaxy. We don't know how they got hyperspace, I think. So the universe is a bit like something like the Star Wars universe under construction. Humans have ventured out of the Earth, but they also possess a lot of memories from their old planet. There are a lot of allusions and references to old Earth in this story, particularly to fairy folk. And it is no wonder because the people who colonized this world, also known as Roland, are of Scots-Irish descent. So it's this kind of cute and charming thing where there are a number of different worlds but they still kind of feel like 1970s or immediate post-war United States. There's, you know, this town, which has been settled by, I don't know, the Pennsylvania Dutch. There's that town, which is settled by Germans. There's this other town, which has Italians in it. So something like that. But anyways, back to the story on hand. Now, the story opens with something like an extreme work of fantasy where there are these two people and they are singing romantic songs and talking in riddles and stuff but they are joined also by certain other things such as a bird-like creature with eyes like yellow lanterns who comes in flying having abducted a baby and also the queen of the realm makes an appearance and she's very scary and it's almost like a pure fantasy realm and the queen is a goddess or a terrible terrible force of nature then we cut to another scene, this time focusing on the actual people colonizing the planet. And the tone is very brisk, matter-of-factly and classic sci-fi. But the difference in these tones is so strong that I actually had to check the book because it's an old 50-year-old paperback with yellowed out pages. I literally thought maybe a page had fallen through and I had maybe snapped to a different story. It felt like skipping to a hard sci-fi story after reading two pages of high Tolkien-esque fantasy. Anyways, I won't bore you with all the details, but it turns out that the child which the bird-like spirit or the alien or whatever has abducted on the first chapter was actually the son or the daughter of a woman colonist on this world. And predictably she's distraught, she's very sad and furious and she somehow hires the service of a sort of private investigator slash Han Solo type character named Eric Sherinford who is actually from the outer world. He's a spacer of some sort. And space travel is very rare in this setting. So this guy is an extraordinary character. And he's a bit of a know-it-all, saying like, I got certain suspicions, but I won't reveal them to you now, and so on and so forth. So together they launch an expedition to this planet's name of the planet is Roland by the way this planet's northern continent which due to the axial tilt of the world is almost constantly in a setting of twilight so there's no light it's very dark and gloomy and celtic and mysterious and this woman and the detective go to the northern continent and they actually have a series of interactions with the local mayor running this northern continent settlement. Remember the planet has one big city and it's got maybe like a hundred thousand people living in it and then you got a whole other continent with I don't know I don't know the numbers but let's say a couple of hundred people living there at most and they are all dispersed in the landscape trying to manage imported human ecology farms and stuff and actually the descriptions of these outlying continents of this already outlying small town feel planet there are some of the most delicious things about this story because to his credit paul anderson is a great writer and you really get this kind of like early winter cold dark small town in pennsylvania kind of feel from this world and its outlying environs 
And of course, out there in the northern continent, people are really scared of little people or, or fairy folk. In the main city, the fairy folk are seen more as an anthropological curiosity. They think they are local scary tales and not much more. Out there in the northern continent, people really believe about the bush devils or the demons or the little people or the fairy folk or whatever you want to call them. And here you can tell that Paul Anderson really knows his folklore well. Remember, something I keep repeating on this channel is that if you want to be a good sci-fi writer, you have to know a lot about things which are actually not sci-fi related. Being a good folklorist makes you a good sci-fi writer because you can then import concepts or sentiments from that other area into your mysterious and strange tales. Paul Anderson uses this knowledge to stupendous effect in this story. In one scene, actually, the detective and the distraught mother go to a little pub in this outlying continent. And there they meet some people. And these people actually, you know, because they are in the middle of nowhere, confronted by a dark and alien realm, what is the most natural thing to do? They sing songs and make music. And in the story, we are actually treated to the entire song as these characters sing. Let me read one of the nicest verses. Here goes. <clears throat> to Arvid came she striding from whence she had watched the dance, the queen of air and darkness with starlight in her glance. The dance weaves under the fire torn. With starlight, love and terror in her immortal eye, the queen of air and darkness. And then, no, the woman screams because it has apparently triggered some sort of PTSD in her. She cannot uh, bear hearing the name of this queen of air and darkness because to these people, the queen and the fairy folk on this alien world are real and she just can't take it. At this stage, we still don't know if the people who stole the child were aliens or some sort of renegade runaway forest people who descended from feral colonists and maybe they have picked up strange habits in the bush. Anyway, the detective and the distraught mother somehow hire something like an armored personnel carrier slash RV vehicle and then he actually has it decked out with 30 millimeter cannon and machine guns and stuff and then they drive out to the wildest darkest part of the northern continent where they hope they will confront these outlanders or these fairy folk whoever whatever they are and uncover the mystery then we cut back to this high fantasy kind of point of view again and then these people who kind of talk like elves are joined by a giant wooden golem like alien and with them there's also something like a speaking will of the wisp which is an incorporeal creature without a body but these three creatures the human the giant wooden golem and the bodiless mist creature they're almost like a band of dungeons and dragons heroes an unlikely group of people or characters assembled and commanded by this mysterious queen of air and darkness and then the narration cuts to our human heroes again camping out in their armored personnel carriers slash rv vehicle I really like that kind of thing, by the way. I wish I could go exploring in something like that. Anyways, then their sensors pick out some life forms. Now, one of them matches a human being. Another matches a giant rhino-sized creature with low body activity. And the third emission comes from something like, I'm quoting here, a low temperature diffuse and unstable emission, as if it were more like a swarm of cells coordinated somehow thermonally hovering at a distance. So this is this will of the wisp thing, whatever it was, is at least real to the senses brought about by this human character. 
Anyways, then obviously a lot of shit happens and these characters come into contact and conflict. It turns out the following is true and it's a real revelation and it's a really creative example of speculative evolution crafted into a really beautiful story with the helpings of a thorough understanding of culture and folklore. So it turns out that this queen of air and darkness has this magnificently strong telepathic effect on human nervous systems. And in the world of this story, telepathy is understood to be some sort of residual radio activity issuing from the brain. It is hinted that sunlight drowns out these telepathic waves, but in the sunless northern continents of this alien world, telepathy can be used more acutely. So in a way that's also common in a lot of 1970s science fiction, parapsychological phenomena are quote-unquote real things that can be measured and understood with science. We just don't know them yet, but in the future of the setting, they will all be understood. And that's what's going on with the Queen of Air and Darkness. She or it has such a strong telepathic effect that our heroes almost fall victim to it. In fact, our know-it-all detective character, remember he's a bit like Han Solo too, was actually very cautious and he actually installed a kind of buzzing radio field generator that would be able to negate these telepathic waves somehow. But first they get into contact with this unlikely warband consisting of this big tree-like monster, this human-like figure and this will of the wisp. Now the detective catches the human and turns out it's just a feral human being. Now the other creature, the big tree-like hulking creature, turns out to be an actual alien life form and our hero actually shoots at it with the machine gun and it kind of like loses blood and runs away or something. But the third thing, the will of the wisp, it drifts over the woman and casts a vision of her lost child onto her, which is so strong that she just loses control, goes crazy and runs off into the bush. Later on, the great telepathic power controlling this realm of this world also comes close to the detective character and the wildling boy he captured. And our detective hero is able to resist it only by holding his hand over the button which controls the buzzing, telepathy-disrupting radio generator thingamabob. And as this immense form of telepathic power comes closer to them, here is what they see. <coughs> Out of the woods came a band of the old folk. Some of them stood forth more clearly than moons and stars and north lights should have caused. He in the van rode a white crone buck, that's like an alien horse slash antelope kind of thing, whose horns were garlanded. His form was manlike but unearthly beautiful. Silver blonde hair falling from beneath the antlered helmet around the proud cold face, the cloak fluttered off his back like living wings. His frost-colored mail rang as he fared. Behind him, to the right and left, rode two who bore swords whereupon small flames gleamed and flickered. Above a flying flock laughed and trilled and tumbled in the breeze. Near them drifted a half-transparent mistiness. Those others who passed among the trees after their chieftain were harder to make out, but they moved in quicksilver grace, and as it were a sound of harps and trumpets. So it's almost like the slow motion march of the elves in one of those vintage Lord of the Rings movies. This cut from a sci-fi like tone to a sort of very florid high fantasy tone is just one of the many great things about this story. But in the last instant, our hero hits the 
telepathy disrupting buzzer kind of thing and then the whole illusion fades away the queen of air and darkness is revealed to be some sort of reptilian alien creature we're never truly told of her description and then we cut to a kind of aftermath scene where actually the battle against the queen of air and darkness has been won the mystery has been unraveled and the detective has saved not only the woman but also her child and also has delivered the feral humans out of the dream projecting power cast by this queen of air and darkness whatever she was so none of those elves or antlered knights were actually real there was a kind of biological force able to project telepathic visions onto the minds of the human beings slowly colonizing this planet but that's not all the creatures like the flying bird like things i mentioned earlier and the giant tree like cold-blooded monster it was called a nicor by the way n-i-c-o-r they were also real too as was the will of the wisp creature you know it was just a spray of protein somehow hanging together in the air now it was physically real those things were not illusions so this great power or hive organism ruling the lightless northern continent of this world was not only able to project telepathic visions onto the minds of the colonists but that being or that civilization or that force remember it's never explained clearly was also able to create synthetic biological forms actually there's a big discussion in the story where the hero ponders upon how a non-technology based civilization might evolve advancing by the manipulation of life rather than the crafting and manipulation of machines and then he arrives at this conclusion where this thing whatever it was was using this twofold technology to slowly domesticate humans but now they have foiled its plot it was using genetically modified creatures to keep company or to interact with people and it was also using this telepathic projection to tap into humanity's long-held mental archetypes so the similarity to elves and moon riders and stuff it was not a coincidence the alien presence was tapping into the scots irish colonists mental architecture and it was bringing up this notion or archetype of little people and riffing off on that to control them it was using these biosynthetic bird creatures to steal babies it was basically a totally incomprehensible alien presence domesticating the human colonists that had been landing on its world almost like an oyster surrounding a foreign particle with mother of pearl to create well a pearl but now that plan has been foiled and our hero is actually slightly sad at coming into such a contact with this native life form he is happy that the feral people have been released from its telepathic hall of mirrors but at the same time he worries that humans might turn the tables on them and exterminate them like the way they exterminated well other people and other animals back on old earth anyways everybody that was the incredible exposition of telepathic biopunk alien fairy folk in paul anderson's queen of air and darkness a really great story not without some interesting reflections in later stories like james cameron's avatar series where as most of you know the blue-skinned navi aliens are indeed able to achieve some biologically mediated spiritual union with the spirit of their world 
and it's also similar to certain creatures and units in the Warhammer universe, especially the Tyranid race, which has some biologically modified psychic attack creatures that can just think really hard and make your brain hurt or enslave you or lure you into false illusions. I'm not saying all of these notions have been quote-unquote borrowed from Paul Anderson's Queen of Air and Darkness, but the story really stands out as a magnificent work, not just because of the originality of this biopunk space alien little people race concept, but also through the way it is written. I really haven't done it justice. You should find it and read it as soon as you can. You will really enjoy it. As a general rule, I know a lot of the audience of this channel is from a younger generation. So to you all, I can recommend as a rule, go find the kind of science fiction that your grandparents and parents enjoyed. There are literally worlds to discover there and reading an actual book is always more fun than doom scrolling on a computer or a smartphone device. Anyways, that was that everybody. That was the C.M. Koseman primer to the alien biopunk little people notions introduced in Paul Anderson's Queen of Air and Darkness. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast and if you have heard of similar stories or similar speculative evolution scenarios just let me know in the comments and as always if you've enjoyed my work please consider giving back through a small donation on Patreon or just get something from the merch store. That's that everybody. I love you all and wherever you are, have a nice day. Goodbye.